I'm going to be pretty quick today. I want it to be fun. It's not going to be heavy duty. Stick, stick with me as best as you can, and uh, we'll learn a little bit something about the urinary tract. Not my favorite organ system. Obviously, GI is, but we'll muddle through. Um, so today's ad agenda, we will meet the urinary tract first, and then we'll do what do kidneys do all day, because they, they are busy. Then uh, the golden elixir of life, which a friend of mine who's a nephrologist and urologist calls, I think you know what she's referring to. So we'll talk about the golden elixir of life, and then we'll look at everybody's favorite segment of the program, cool pics of bad diseases. Um, so first, let's uh, meet the urinary tract. And there are important bits and bonus bits and the important bits are basically four things, which is why I think the urinary tract is boring, but it, it's actually not. But um, there are kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra. For, and this will be focused on mammals, not birds and reptiles who are um, quite different in their urinary tract. So think of mammals, cats and dogs. And we have two kidneys. We know that we can live with one. We have two ureters that empty into the urinary bladder, which seems redundant. We call it bladder, but there is another bladder, the gallbladder in the body. So urinary bladder versus um, gallbladder. The urethra, the ureters empty into the bladder, and the urethra is the exit out. Bonus bits include the blood supply, and we know all organs have a blood supply, but there's an intricate dance that happens between the blood supply to the kidneys, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but obviously the kidney, kidneys filter everything, right? They filter the blood and pull different um, toxins and other things out, and we'll talk about that. Uh, prostate and boy bits, we know that they hook into the urinary tract, and some people call it the genital urinary tract. We are not talking about boy bits or girl bits today, but know that they, they interact a little bit. So kidneys, we'll talk more about this very important organ and really the business end of the urinary tract. We have a spare. Uh, we can do without one kidney. If we have one functional kidney, we now know that with years and years and years or decades of doing renal transplantation in people, that as long as that one kidney is healthy, you can live on it for years and years and years. We don't do renal transplants in dogs, but we do in cats. And again, cats can live very, very well with one kidney for a long period of time. But we'll get back to that later. So uh, ureters, they connect each kidney to the urinary bladder. So we have two of them. And they're somewhat passive conduits. There's not a lot of action going on in the ureters. They can get things stuck in them, which is bad. They can be a source of infections can go up the ureter. Um, really bad if you cut it during surgery, which happens. Or if you have abdominal trauma, sometimes they can rupture. But in general, they're not uh, very exciting compared to the other parts of the urinary tract. Uh, the bladder is basically a storage site for urine, but it is muscular, right? We know that the bladder contracts to expel urine. There's a very intricate dance that occurs between the urinary bladder and the urethra, the urethra being the exit out, right? They got to kind of coordinate because usually the urethra is fairly tight. And then when the bladder contracts, the urethra has to relax, let urine go out. Then the urethra tightens, the bladder relaxes. But there's uh, quite an intricate, again, neurologic interplay. There are diseases that can happen because of um, incoordination between the two. And you can get spasming bladders and all, all other kinds of things. But again, that's probably the most exciting thing that the bladder does, unfortunately. Um, and it doesn't modify urine. So once urine gets to the ureters and the bladder, there's not much going on with it. And then finally, the urethra is the conduit out. There's one of those. It is also muscular, as I just um, mentioned. It is short in females, in mammals, and long in males. And Annie can explain that later, maybe. Uh, <laughs> But it, um, that, that relative size explains why females are more predisposed to urinary tract infections because bacteria have a shorter distance to travel into the bladder than in males. Um, and we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. 
So on to what do kidneys do all day? For you guys who have kids, if you don't have this book, it's an awesome book. For you who have little kids, go get it. And thank you to my daughter. When they get to be 15, they can help you Photoshop. So she helped me Photoshop both the kidney and put, instead of people, what do kidneys do all day? Kidneys are actually pretty remarkable organs. They do a lot of stuff, so, things that we probably have intuited and others that we don't. They obviously remove fluid and they're important in fluid balance. They regulate our blood pH. So they're very, very, very important in keeping our blood pH in a very, very tight range, right? We can't fluctuate too basic or too acidic or we will run into problems. And the kidneys are very, very important. Obviously, they eliminate metabolic wastes, so waste that comes from our normal metabolic processes. I think a lot of people have probably heard the term uremia or uremic poisoning in cases where the kidneys aren't functioning. Well, urea is normal. It's a byproduct of protein metabolism. And as long as our kidneys are functioning fine, it's not a problem for us. But if it builds up, it does cause a problem. So sometimes when we think of metabolic waste, we think of it being particularly toxic, but it's not really, it's just normal. But if there's a, if some kind of um, problem with kidney function, they can build up and then be a problem. Obviously drugs and other toxins, toxin with a capital T, right? Things that are um, toxic substances are actually eliminated through the kidneys. Um, so they get exposed to a lot of um, things that we get exposed to in the environment are eventually processed through the kidneys. They're about important in the balance of electrolytes, so sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, it's a whole bunch. I'm gonna show you a picture that's gonna frighten everyone later, but trust me, it will work through it. That talks about, again, the balance of electrolytes. Here's three that we don't often think about. One, they're important in blood pressure control, and that's where the blood bits come into play because the blood supply to the kidneys, they interact to help with how we control blood pressure and many antihypertensive medications work at the kidney. We'll talk about that. That's something that I think we don't always think about. The kidneys are also very important in red blood cell production, which seems completely screwy, right? Like why would a kidney produce a hormone that's important in stimulating your bone marrow to make red cells, but it does. So in cases when the kidneys are not functioning well, you can become anemic. The mechanism to make red cells is perfectly fine, but because the kidneys are not making the hormone that tells the bone marrow, hey, we need more red cells, you can become anemic. And again, an important function of the kidneys that I think we don't always think about. And then finally, they are also important in the production of the active form of vitamin D. So we think of vitamin D, we get it from the sun, don't wear sunscreen or keep your, watch your sunscreen. We eat, we take oral supplements for vitamin D, but the kidneys are very important in the process of converting that to a form that your body can use. So again, some things that we may not think of right off the bat when we think of what the kidneys do all day. Um, complicated diagram, hang in there with me. The kidney is made up of these functional units called nephrons. And I think sometimes we hear the word nephron. And what's really peculiar and kind of bad about nephrons is if any part of the nephron is damaged, it can't repair itself and the whole nephron dies. And that is really, really important when we see toxins and things harm the kidneys. If it dinks one part of the nephron, the whole nephron, the whole functional unit is gone. We have millions of nephrons, so we've got lots of backup. But again, that's a little unusual over other parts of the body where maybe part of it, like think of your heart. If you had a heart attack and part of your wall gets damaged, the rest of the heart can still function, right? It can still work. It may not work perfectly, but that's not the case in the kidney if a nephron gets damaged. And that is any part of the nephron. This unit of nephron is, starts in a place called the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, and we'll show a picture of this. And then urine starts making this circuitous way through all these different tubules, a tubule with all different parts where different things happen at each section of that. So let's take a look at, and here's the psychedelic part. I love this picture. This is a, so sorry, more nephron stuff. This is Bowman's capsule in the glomerulus, and this is an afferent artery going in, efferent coming out. There are 
there's, it's like a tangle of blood in here. And at that point is where fluid starts to be pushed out. There's some pressure here. And then it goes out and starts its long journey through all of the tubules. Some blood pressure medications work at the afferent and efferent arterioles. For example, um, you probably have heard of ACE inhibitors. They work at the efferent arteriole. So when we take a blood pressure medication, it doesn't just affect, we think of it as heart, right? And it affects our heart, but it also can affect the kidneys and how they function. And so it's really important when we take an antihypertensive, it has something to do, it affects the kidney as well. Interesting fact for everyone, in cats and dogs, they do not get essential hypertension, which is what we get, right? We just get hypertension for some reason. In cats and dogs, 99 point, let's say 99% of all hypertensive animals, it's because of kidney disease. So when we see a patient come in and we measure their blood pressure and it's high and we document it and say, yeah, this, this patient's blood pressure is elevated, we start looking for a kidney problem. That's really different than people where we tend to have essential hypertension, which means it just like happens, right? And they can, there's genetic components and everything else to it. So that's a little bit different in, in animals. So yet more nephron stuff. We talked about when things go into the glomerulus blah, blah, and fluid starts to go out and then it makes this big giant you know, journey through the rest of the kidney. And you can see what happens at all these different parts and you don't have to memorize it though I will ask you about it later. No, that, I'm not gonna ask you about it later. Um, water, sodium chloride, all potassium that's going in, it's going out, urea, some of it is passive, some of it is actively transported, glucose and some other stuff come out early on that are reabsorbed. And so all of this, as it travels, urine travels down, or what's gonna be urine, um, travels down these tubes, it gets modified till it comes out here and goes to the ureter and that's urine. Bing. And then it travels to ureter, to the bladder, through the urethra, not really modified again. All right, so on to the golden elixir of life. And for this section, each page will have a golden retriever on it. So, because we have lots of pictures of golden retriever. So I, I, I think it's no surprise to anyone that 91 to 96% of urine is water. There are these inorganic salts. Again, so we talked about sodium, potassium, chloride, organic compounds. This, I meant, I wrote, hormones and metabolites, but there are other things that can be coming through. Those could include in that list maybe toxins that are being processed drugs that are coming um, into the urine. Don't eat the yellow snow, right? Um, but very important. I wanted to spend a minute on the urinalysis because first of all, there's no, we can't have a presentation without our picture of Astro, though Astro looks a little weird. But um, it's not on my computer. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your analysis because we all do this. We pee in a cup, right? Or we go chase our dog around with a, with a pie pan and we bring it in and then they whisk it in the back and something happens to the urine. Well, what happens is the first thing we do is we take a look at it and write some stuff down. I'll talk about that. But we have these nifty little pads that dip in the urine and then they change colors and you hold it up against the scale there and it says look at this in 10 seconds, look at this in 30 seconds, look at this in 40 seconds and it's the dipstick that you may hear us talk about and it'll do all measures all kinds of things and this next slide this is actual an actual an actual report that we get for all of our girls patients this is what an Antec urinalysis looks like when we get it back and it looks at a bunch of things um, you'll put what collection method, it, they'll look at the color. It's plain old look at the color. What's the appearance though? I always call this the turbidity. You know, is it cloudy? Is it clear? Um, the specific gravity we'll talk about, but basically it's a measure of how concentrated the urine is, right? How much water is in it? How dilute is it? And there's a normal range and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, later in the talk because this is really important and a lot of people talk about it specific gravity. Is the urine concentrated? Is it dilute? Um, and what that means as far as kidney disease, we look at the pH. Animals tend to be slightly more acidic 
is considered normal in them um, than humans, but basically the same. And then these are all the things that we're dipping for, proteins, glucose, right? Diabetes, big one, right? Is there, uh, glucose should never be in the urine, ever. If it's there, it's abnormal. There are conditions, they're not as frequent as diabetes that can cause glucose to spill in the urine. There are some congenital problems. There are, um, if you have an infection, you can have sometimes glucose. If the infection affects the tubules, remember the tubules, and that's where glucose is, either comes out of the urine. If the tubule is damaged, you can have glucose uh, leak. One of the classic examples is, you guys probably know about leptospirosis. It's a bacterial infection of the kidneys. We vaccinate our dogs against it. It's bad news. Um, lepto, I've seen, cause glucose in the urine. Not to the level of a diabetic, but it will cause glucose to spill. Ketones, we all on ketogenic diets. So, you know, 20 years ago, I would have had to talk a lot about ketones. Now I don't. But people actually buy these strips, right, if they're doing their ketogenic diet, right, and they dip their urine to see if they have ketones in their urine. It um, can be bad. Uh, I still have to wrap my head around normal ketones in the urine. But we often see it with out-of-control diabetics um, that, for example, most kids who are diabetic present to the ER because they have acids that have built up in their blood and ketones in their urine, and they are um, in diabetic shock. So we sometimes see that with dogs. Bilirubin, boys are allowed to have a little bilirubin. Girls typically don't. Um, they have a little bilirubin. And then when we look at a urine sample and we take it and whisk it in the back and we dip it, Sometimes what I would do is spin it first, and we always spin it, and we make a little pellet, and you better not have a giant pellet because that means you have a lot of cells or goo in your urine, and then we spread that on a slide, and we look at it, and we look for things like white blood cells. We look for red cells. Casts are actually collections of white cells, and again, if you remember the really convoluted tubules, they, um, the white cells can take on the appearance of a tubule, and you see these little tubes of cells. Those are casts. Crystals, obviously, sometimes if you have stones, or if you don't have stones and you're thinking about making a stone, you might have crystals. Bacteria, which you should never see, uh, though if you have a free catch, maybe we'll let you have a few. And then sometimes cells, fat, sperm, normal in, in boy dogs to see that. Um, so anyway, that's what we look at when we look at a urinalysis and whisk that cup back to the back of uh, our clinic. And now we're at about specific gravity because a lot of people talk about this and you probably hear a lot like, my cat can't concentrate. It has kidney disease. My dog can't concentrate so well. Everybody's we're worried about it. And the definition is that it compares the density of urine to water. You use this nifty little thing called the free refractometer. This lid lifts up. You put a couple drops of urine, you smash it down, and you look at it like this. It's not blue usually. It's usually like kind of gray and white. And it gives you an idea of the solids and the concentrating ability of the kidneys. Now, specific gravity is actually an indirect measure of kidney function. You can have red cells and your kidneys can be fine. You can have white cells and your kidneys can be fine. You can have a little glucose and your kidneys can be fine. But one of the first things that happens when your kidneys start to not work as well is you have problems concentrating or diluting your urine. Okay, so two situations. If you forget to drink something and you're out and you're hiking and it's hot and you get dehydrated, right? Your kidneys should be like, you should be like gerbil mode, right? You should be saving every tiny bit of fluid you can. And when we think of a specific gravity, if we were measuring it, it would be high, right? And your kidneys have to work to do that. They have to work to absorb fluid. And, and that would be appropriate. If you were dehydrated and you had dilute urine, there's something going on there. Your kidneys should be saving that urine. Next week is the Super Bowl. You go to your friend's house. They have a keg. You drink a lot of beer. What happens? You make a lot of urine right? And your body has to get rid of that excess fluid. And so you make a dilute urine, right? I am, the urine's more dilute than normal, right? Your kidneys have to work to actually dilute urine. And so one of the myths I'd like to dispel, and I apologize for veterinarians who put it this way, which is, oh, your, your animal has a dilute urine. They, they've got kidney disease. Not necessarily, because your kidneys have to work 
to make a very dilute urine, all right? But there is this range called isosthenuria, where the specific gravity of the urine is the same as plasma, so it's just passive, like ain't nothing going on there. Plasma's going through that little capsule, the glomerulus, fluid's moving out, but there's no change, right? The kidneys can't work, so it's just kind of passively dumping into your ureter and in your bladder, and that's really simplistic. Isosthenuria is the danger zone. That means your kidneys are not working. Now, you drank a lot of beer at your friend's party at the Super Bowl. You have a dilute urine. Well, as you start drinking normally, you're going to pass through this isosthenuria on your way back to concentrating your urine like you should, right? So sometimes if we measure this, we might say, you know, bring us another urine sample. This is an easy one. Free catch works just fine. And you can look at it and see, is this persistent or did my dog maybe just drink a bunch of water ahead of time or whatever. When it's not normal is, again, if you have a dehydrated patient, and a lot of kidney cases are, because their water is just like, just passively passing through and going out. They can't, they can't hold on to it. And to, they'll drink more water in an attempt, right, to correct their fluid balance, but they can't possibly drink enough water usually as they get more advanced, and then that's dangerous. There are other, there's a bunch of other weird diseases that can cause problems with your ability to concentrate your urine. Um, but kidney disease is one of them. One of them is diabetes. What do diabetics do? Drink like crazy, right? They're thirsty all the time. For a different reason, if you um, think of glucose going out in the urine, because you just got so much glucose and your kidneys are trying to get rid of it, um, remember you guys, you guys are all too young to remember this experiment. This was one of uh, the things I did when I was in school is, you know how you put the starch and you dye it blue and you put it in the little dialysis tubing and you put, it's hypertonic and you put it in water and what does it do? It get, blows up, right? Because water wants to go into the area of the high osmotic, um, you know, the high concentration of glucose. Same thing with this, like the, the water wants to go with that glucose out. And so you can't, again, that's simplistic, but you can't, it's hard to drink enough. And so that's one of the instances where we would not necessarily say isosthenia is all due to kidney disease, but it's important. And a lot of times when we take our animals in, we're gonna hear our vet talk about how the kidneys are concentrating urine and look at it. And it is an indirect measure. So remember, it takes work to dilute your urine when you have a lot of beer, and it takes work to concentrate your urine. And if you're in the middle, then it's problematic. All right, so the moment you've all been waiting for, the cool pics of bad diseases. So I found some interesting pictures, nothing gross. So no like kidneys out on plates or so. If you're eating lunch, I promise you will not be grossed out unless Cystoscopy pictures or ultrasounds bother you. So, ultrasound, a great, great, great way to look at kidneys. Great. Kidneys image, wonderful on ultrasound. And ultrasound is a great modality. This is a, what a normal kidney looks like on a long cross section. We call it the racetrack view. You can understand why. And that is a very, very normal looking kidney. Dog or cat, they're going to look like this. The next one, wow, is that even a kidney, huh? looks really different. Like the, we don't see anything that kind of looks like a racetrack. There's some fluid. You can see the kidney. Fluid's black. Look, there's fluid outside the kidney. That's probably something to be concerned about. And that is a kidney that has leptospirosis. So that's a big plump kidney. Probably it's a painful kidney. It is an infected kidney. And so again, on ultrasound, when we look at that, it's really obvious that there's something going on in the kidney, and that would be one I'd say that looks like an infection. The only other thing that I might say would look like this if it was a cat is lymphoma. It can sometimes look like that um, in a cat kidney. Next one, never ever let your kidney get to look like this. So you guys can probably see it's shaped like a kidney. It's got some of the appearance of a racetrack like a kidney, but it's super, 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 super bright right, white, right? That's not a factor of two different ultrasound techniques. That's what this kidney is. And again, we see some fluid outside, some halos, rings. Missy, what is it? It's um, 
this is what an antifreeze kidney looks like. And almost nothing else will look like this. Um, this is not happy to find because by the time the kidneys get to this, they're probably failing. And they're not a dog we can really recover. But it's very diagnostic. And sometimes people don't know that their dog has had exposure or their cat. And it will look like that. Last one. What the heck is going on here? This is two kidneys, left and right. There are kidneys here. One, you can barely see it. It's kind of irregular and small and doesn't really look like a kidney. If I told you this was a cat um, and this cat is 18 years old and it's getting a little sick and a little dehydrated, that's what a kidney looks like that has chronic kidney disease. They shrink, they lose their normal architecture, they get lumpy bumpy, they get really tiny. Um, and so that's a very, very typical appearance for, I dare a 19 year old cat not to look like that. And they can still be okay, but it's obvious why they're having um, problems with their kidneys. So next, we're on to the bladder. Oh, it's pink. It's like orange on here and pink on here. That is so cool. I'm pretty sure, is Nicole here? Because sure, I would start twitching, I think, because <laughs> pink is definitely not one of our approved colors. Anyway. Um, this is a normal bladder. Fluid, fluid is great because it's really easy to image. It's black. It's easy to see. Uh, and this is a very normal looking bladder. Again, you want your bladder full. It's nice, spread out, thin wall. Next one, helpfully labeled. Thank you so much. This is what a bladder stone looks like in, in, um, in the urinary bladder, again, the bladder really needs to be distended with urine, but because of it being solid mineral, it casts a shadow behind it. So you can't, because the sound waves bounce off, the sound waves are always coming up from here in an ultrasound going this way. Uh, gas in the bowel will also look like it, so you gotta be careful that you, as you can see here, that's not a stone, that's outside the bladder, that's what gas looks like. And then um, the next one I want to show you is going to be, I think, really obvious. So, oh, well, we have a bladder, but something's growing off the wall. And they've helpfully put Doppler ultrasound, which looks for blood flow, and it's got blood flow. So it is not a stone, right? It's not shadowing. It's not super white. It's actually growing upside down. So this is what a bladder tumor would look like when we, um, and almost nothing else will look like that. So again, uh, it's, Ultrasound's a really great modality to look for bladder tumors. Okay, now, that's a weird looking picture, but this is actually, we're gonna move to cystoscopy. So this is where you're using an a endoscope to take a look at the bladder and the urethra. And it's really, again, a great modality for not only looking, but getting biopsies. So we get biopsies. So this is actually a girl dog. This is the urethra. Um, we're kind of in the vaginal vault, going right in. Girl bits that way. Don't go that way. Go down here. And as we move down the urethra, this is what we see. So we pop in this hole. We start going down. And the urethra is really smooth. That looks like it's hot pink. It's not usually that hot pink. But it, um, but it is, uh, again, like kind of pale, reddish pink. Very smooth. Should be easy. And you pop into the bladder. And this is what a bladder wall looks like. It is, looks pale, but it's, this is normal. And there's two ways when you go in to look at the bladder. You can swim through fluid. Usually we let the urine out because it looks like a really swampy swimming pool. Like it's like yellow and there's bubbles and stuff. And you can either put saline in or sometimes what I like to do is let it drain out and then put air in. And then you just got like uh, the inside of bladder. So that's a very normal looking bladder. And then this is the bladder, and this little slot right here is where the ureter comes in from the kidney. So it's an area we always want to take a peek and make sure we take a look at those. And what's really exciting is you can actually see urine squirting in sometimes during your endoscopy. You can actually see, because we're always, because we, um, we're always urinating, because we're always making urine. It's micturating when we go to the bathroom. So just a little urination trivia for you. So we're always urinating. And you can tell people that we are always urinating. So um, moving on, um, bladder wall. This is a dog that had chronic and recurrent urinary tract infections. And you can see it's pretty inflamed. You can actually do biopsies, which are cool. 
this is, normally we'd know this, those are stones, and they've actually popped into the urethra while you're doing your scope. And people now pull them out. We have special little traps that you can pull stones out that way. Sometimes it can take a long time, so then you go, well, do I just open them up and take all the stones out? But you can also uh, get, them, get them via cystoscopy, and they float around. But if you're not sure what type of stones, some are dissolvable, right? You could actually grab this and analyze it and then decide, is this a kind of stone I can dissolve with diet? Or is it a stone that's going to require surgery or going back in and grabbing those? Um, this one is a bladder. So this wall, we can tell, tell is still smooth, but inflamed. But look at these guys. This is actually transitional cell carcinoma early in a bladder. We would not have been able to see this on ultrasound. Because you might have said, oh, the bladder is just not really distended. That's why I'm seeing these little bulges in the wall. But it's a no-brainer on cystoscopy to, to find those. And the worst, though, is obvious. This is like that case I just showed you before, where you've got a big mass growing there. And um, transitional cells are bad because they tend to be right at the edge of the bladder and the urethra, so they're not surgical. They block things. They don't spread, and that's the cruelty of them. They spread locally, so they cause a lot of problems for the dog, but they're not like when we think of hemangiosarcoma, osteosarcoma that spreads and kills dogs. But, I mean, if you can't urinate, that's a problem. And so you have to, they put tubes in. Sometimes we will do palliative radiation to try to shrink these. Um, the last picture is this is actually in a urethra, where, you remember I said it's smooth, pink, nice and easy? I mean, this is like the whole urethra. You start going down and you just got obstructions everywhere that's all tumor. There's no way to diagnose this any other way than to look at it with a cystoscope because you can't see it with ultrasound. You can get an idea it may be there, but um, it's really bad if transitional cell gets into the urethra. We have a study right now that you guys may be familiar with. We funded it not June 2019, but June in 2018, where they're trying to look at how early can we detect this stuff. Um, because again, the earlier, um, the better for a lot of these dogs. There is palliative therapy you can do that will help shrink for a while. And again, the earlier you can get to it before it gets to this point, the better. Um, so that's it. It was really, really short today. Uh, and I'm happy to have any questions you guys may have. But thanks so much. Thanks for uh, tolerating that last minute swerve from Janet's laminitis to, to my urinary tract to Palooza. Um, Sean goes, how many Palooza's do you have? But um, I can have lots, but right now just two, which is I think the poop of Palooza and this one. So anyway, and remember that we have these up on the YouTube channel. So if you have a donor that's interested or whatever, they can totally watch this. Uh, and we would welcome people to take a peek at all of our, all of the yay sciences are up there for everyone to watch. So thank you.